Good evening, and uh, thank you for coming out, as they say. The, uh, I was going to give you a talk some time ago. Didn't have much voice then. Haven't got much more now, but I'll see what we can do to, to uh, suit. Um, Amateur Radio New South Wales. Uh, for those who don't know, that's our trading name. Uh, our real name is the Wireless Institute of Australia, New South Wales Division. And uh, due to the fact that uh, the national body reconstituted themselves in 2004, um, we uh, opted a trading name, the uh, same as Victoria did, so there'd be less confusion with the uh, uh, which was which. But on that basis, we're the original, and uh, we still claim that as the original. The uh, WIA, um, that didn't actually come into existence till 1924, and they've had a few versions of that. And in reality, it's only been a membership body since 2004. Okay. As I said, uh, we go back, we've just passed our 106th anniversary. 11th of March 1910 was when they had their uh, inaugural meeting in the uh, Hotel Australia, which uh, is on the corner of, um, well, was on the corner of uh, Martin Place and Castle Ray Street. And uh, it was rather the uh, place, I think, to be in 1910. It was uh, somewhere where I think most of the collection went to. Anyway, quite a gathering assembled on that up Friday afternoon to uh, uh, discuss matters that was concerning the experimenters of the day. Mainly the government was, in typical fashion, uh, being difficult with them, particularly that they were charging them a pretty high fee. Uh, in those days, something like three guineas. If anyone remembers what that was, that was uh, one pound, one shilling, or you know, a dollar, uh, two dollars uh, ten these days. So that was six dollars thirty in 1910 money. Uh, that was quite a substantial portion of one's wages. Anyway, as I said, the um, they they had this particular meeting. Um, I described them in a history sheet, which I'll give you at the end of things. Um, they were all relatively new to uh, the game and they were all just general experimenters. The, um, they were finding the authorities, the PMG in those days, were difficult to deal with and uh, the high licence costs and there were long delays in getting permission to operate. Nothing much has changed, has it? But that was to get formal permission to operate their apparatus, as the equipment was called in those days. In the early part of 1910, Two experimenters of note, one particular was Wally Hannon, the other was the, more the convener of the meeting, uh, um, George Taylor. And uh, uh, although George was never an amateur as such, he dabbled in most things, including uh, uh, flying uh, gliders off the uh, uh, coast here and places like that and around about that same time. But as I say, on the Friday afternoon of the uh, 11th of March 1910, they had a meeting. There was something, according to the m media of the day, uh, around about 50 people showed up, and ma they made the comment that even some ladies were in attendance. Um, and as I say, it was at the ho then Hotel Australia. Um, there was a reporting of the uh, meeting in both the Daily Telegraph and the Sydney Morning Herald in the following days, so that was it started to get off the ground, and they formed and they mo the experimenters in attendance voted to form an institute, uh, as they described it, and uh, they named their institute the um, Institute of Wireless Telegraphy, which was the mode of the day. There was no no voice really in existence at that stage. And uh, the two conveners, uh, George became the president and the secretary became uh, Wally Hannon. Um, and with a short time though, their name was changed to the Wireless Institute of New South Wales. In uh, each of the call sign listings at around that time, there were a considerable number of experimenters, people 
have become fascinated with the new science. Whether they were all experiment is not known as the uh, listeners also had to be licensed. Anyway, they got underway fairly well and as I said, it started in New South Wales. Um, the Victoria came along the following year. The Victorians of course do keep trying to claim that they were the originals, but uh, uh, we know better than that. So uh, anyway, they were around in 1911 onwards and other states in various ways that <coughs> started to form their organisations. World War I of course intervened in 1914 and they closed all the experimenters down. After all, uh, you can't have uh, uncontrolled people chattering on the air even though it was very limited radio in the form of spark transmissions predominantly. And uh, anyway, the war was over and in 1920, or it took till 1920, to even uh, try and get uh, some operation back again because the Navy had control of the uh, spectrum and they weren't giving it back. So uh, after quite a deal of fighting they got the, uh, the uh, thing underway again. New South Wales is still fairly prominent in the media that uh, I've been able to read. And talking of media, of course your Richard SKY has done a very good job in uh, searching out. He's got that knack of being able to uh, go on the uh, thing, discovering of course he brought your organisation uh, forward in or back in time from uh, what was I think once thought in about the 1930s into the, certainly the 1920s and, uh, um, and uh, like a lot of organisations the uh, uh, New South Wales Division is fairly continuous in its operation I mean uh, but you can trace your or most clubs can trace by various names and otherwise it's a bit like the, uh, the axe that it might have four new heads and three new handles but it's still the same axe. But anyway, that doesn't alter the fact that uh, many of you have got long uh, histories like uh, tonight for example Waverley's having their meeting and still um, our WIA president uh, Phil Waite is uh, uh, giving them a talk over there. Um, and they are going to have their 100th centenary in uh, 2019. So they're starting to lo line up in that direction. But likewise, th they uh, wandered all over the place at times. Their call sign remained constant, even though it floated all over Sydney. It was often registered down at Engadine and places like that. But anyway, they're well and fl flourishing these days. Sorry? <laughs> oh, vaguely, vaguely, yes. <laughs> yes, oh, you got that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm talking of your uh, scribe. As we said, Richard has uh, been a good searcher for you. Um, anyway, as I said, things started to get underway in the 1920s. And by then, the uh, uh, broadcasting was just round the corner. The entrepreneurs were very keen on this new radio uh, and you'll know from other sources that the, uh, most of the operation of course was what is in the broadcast band down the low end there is the uh, uh, 600 kc, uh, 500 that sort of thing where most of the activity was and the spark transmissions of the day of course uh, really only one of you got on um, and that's when they pushed the amateurs down to uh, those useless short waves as they thought and the amateurs of course did their bit down there discovered what you could do there and of course naturally the uh, authorities or otherwise wanted their cut of the action down in that part of the world but as we say we've moved into 1920 uh, uh, and in 1922 the uh, Wireless Institute of Australia New South Wales Division was registered as a company and uh, uh, but it was not until 1924 that a WIA structure came into place. And the way it worked in those days, the uh, WIA was formed as a national body because national bodies are required to uh, uh, deal with the uh, Commonwealth government. You can't have a state talk to the Commonwealth, uh, particularly if you go back to when we had radio branches. A state could talk to the local radio branch 
but you couldn't talk to head office. You had to do that through, and it applies to every organisation that has to have their uh, national bodies as well. So the WIA came into existence with uh, their members were the, the divisions in each state, and the membership, uh, the amateur membership, belonged to the states. So for until, 19, uh, until 20, oh, sorry, 2004, when uh, the WIA did their restructuring, uh, membership in New South Wales through the New South Wales Division. Okay, as I say, uh, the uh, WIA got formed in May 1924, and uh, in those days, as I say, the uh, uh, the national body was the liaise with the PMG. The PMG in those days was located in Melbourne, so the policy basically was that the national headquarters uh, has to be where the PMG is. So they remained in Melbourne for quite a long, well, literally a long time. In the 70s, the uh, PMG, along with many other government departments, were eventually forced to go to Canberra. and. Uh, a national structure was offered to the uh, VK1s, but they declined the uh, thing, saying it would be too much work to have such a, a thing. Even though people had found a, uh, a property that, or a plot of land that could be developed into a national headquarters, it was actually in a block next to the uh, Royal Mint, so they could have done a, a bit better there. But anyway, that never came to pass, and uh, so the, uh, even though the department had moved to Canberra, they uh, maintained the operation of the WIA in Melbourne. Okay, um, as we said, the 1920s saw the rise of broadcasting. As you probably are aware, the first formal broadcast, 2SB, which became 2BL, uh, November 1923 came, came to air and uh, uh, got, got their uh, act together, soon to be followed by another, and that was the year of the uh, uh, seal sets, where you had a receiver locked to one channel, and you paid a licence fee for that, but that only lasted a bit over 12 months, but uh, uh, it wasn't a very popular approach of things, and there were, of course, commercials starting to uh, come up after that. And if you just think of your own history here, I mean, before you got uh, uh, to uh, the uh, emergency centre down there, you were at the old radar station in uh, Beacon Hill. And just up the road from there was a, uh, uh, in the 60s I can remember, made a very good aerial for shortwave listening, was what was left of the 2KY uh, broadcast site. And, uh, uh, well, the, on, on the road that goes down from uh, what used to then be the flashing light at uh, Warringah Road, which went down into, um, uh, Brookvale and uh, so somewhere in that vicinity was the radar station that uh, and uh, when it was decommissioned various services including uh, your organisation were uh, operatives within that building and as I say uh, a few hundred yards up the road was these two poles with a T-type antenna suspended between it the scrap merchants had got in and cut the, the uh, uh, vertical feeder as far as they could get to, but if you got on top of your van and uh, the likes, you could get up and put an alligator clip on the thing, and it went, went very good as an aerial system. Um, okay. Now, of course, in 1920s, with the various things, the, the entrepreneurs, the, uh, you know, the real professionals out there, started to get upset with uh, all these amateur experimenters because there was really a, then only the one organisation, particularly in New South Wales, the uh, New South Wales Division. So they uh, wanted to try and take over and use the, the division as their uh, um, base to become, uh, you know, the professionals. After all, experimenters are no good within us type thing. And there was quite a, uh, a squabble and for a while, the uh, New South Wales Division uh, literally faded away to the point where um, 
another organisation, the ARTL, the Amateur Radio Transmitters League, came into existence for about 18 months. In that time, the IRE, the Institute of Radio Engineers, was formed and these professionals were doing their damnedest, apparently, to try and get hold of the uh, certificate of uh, company registration of the uh, um, New South Wales Division. They had no success, it just could not be found. So uh, it sort of was in quiet limbo for a while. And uh, in the 30s, when uh, the IRE decided, well, let that mob have their, their play, we'll form the uh, professional body and uh, uh, the like. And uh, the few members that thought they were still members apparently paid a shilling each to uh, reconstitute their membership so that the uh, New South Wales Division could be uh, reformed. And away it went. It was all, all fairly good from uh, then onwards and started to uh, um, get back into business. By then, of course, uh, voice had come in. The uh, spark transmissions had been taken over by CW trans type transmissions. There were fights, of course, between the supporters of sparks, the supporters of continuous wave, uh, and of course it continued on in uh, later life when sideband first started to raise its head. The objections to that of this duck talk type thing, the AM ones would never, you know, just couldn't stand this duck talk. And uh, so all the way through the modes have had a, had a fight in the respective ways. Um, <laughs> Well, there's now so many modes in, in other directions. Um, OK, of course, the 1930s was the Depression era and uh, uh, there were quite a lot of radio clubs formed in the suburbs on the basis that if you could walk to it, you'd go to it. You know, people just couldn't afford travel or the like, so um, that was their uh, uh, activities. And there's also, I saw somewhere in reference, that there was somewhere like 250 magazines in Australia or periodicals or papers devoted in some form or other to radio. So uh, what have we got today? Silicon chip and AR. Um, okay. The, uh, um, so the depression is more or less over. Amateurs are going fairly well. Permission was uh, given to the various divisions to conduct a broadcast. Uh, in the prior to that, they only had sort of nets or other things. Of course, the regulations are such that you, um, in the earlier days, amateurs could play music after hours when broadcast stations closed down. They could come up on the frequency. So eventually, music got banned and uh, the like. Um, and uh, that just harking back to the 1920s and earlier, the first call signs that were in Australia started with an X, X for experimenter, and there was some logic to it, uh, like um, XA A for example was the New South Wales one and they went up through the alphabet with the various blocks of uh, call signs. And But when they started to work this overseas DX and elsewhere, they started to get into trouble. So they, you know, everyone around the world's all got the same X sort of calls. So they then started to introduce some geographical calls and we had uh, a, a got added to ours for a while in Australia. And then the, uh, uh, there was a AO, Australia, Oceania, something like that came into existence. But the world was in chaos. Um, we also go back, you've heard of the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union that was brought in in the uh, 1800s mainly to regulate uh, the cable systems and the telegraph systems that are around the world. But when radio started to come in, of course, uh, McCaney did his first bit, the well, well, they credit him with it, but everyone else played around in the, that sort of thing. Uh, he was 1896, so. Um, the world started to think that there was a need to have uh, some conferencing and the first conference was in Berlin in 1903. There was another one in 1906 in Berlin. Um, and interestingly, Australia has been represented at every ITU conference since then. 
uh, there was London in 1912 and there was to be one in 1917. But due to some other little squabble going on, uh, nothing happened. And it wasn't until 1927 that the next conference was held, and I think that was Atlantic City in the States. And that was a point where they introduced the uh, prefix, call sign prefixes, uh, well, for all radio services. And if you look at your call book uh, and listings like that, you'll see that there are blocks de devoted throughout the world. For example, Australia uh, doesn't have very many compared to, say, the Yanks, who have got uh, A's, K's, W's, N's, uh, and uh, the rest. We, of course, have uh, VHA to VNZ, uh, VZA to VZZ, and AXA to AXZ. That's our block of call signs. And they, of course, w when you look around, they're not only amateurs. I mean, amateurs around the world get a, um, that as the prefix plus the rest. But everything else that needs identification, um, land mobile and uh, um, those sort of services are your three-letter ones like BKG. Shipping uses four letters out of that block. So our marine service, I don't think we have any boats now that are uh, probably Australian registered, but uh, they were a VM and a couple more letters. And aircraft, you can always pick where an aircraft comes from, except the Yanks. Um, the um, aircraft have a five unit uh, number. In other words, you'll see our aircraft, uh, VH, uh, something or other, like the Qantas ones are VHE and a couple of other um, there. So it's used as the overall uh, identification. <coughs> the other thing with, with call signs, of course, we get um, in Australia, we've got our, uh, got some gentlemen are looking for some chairs, I think. Yeah. Um, but, um, how did we end up with the numbers that uh, we have, for example, VK2 two for New South Wales and 3 for Victoria and uh, uh, the like? They were military districts. Um, so they just use those numbers to uh, uh, create things. Of course, there's been the changes over the years. Canberra didn't have a block of their own. They used to be VK2s. In their case, they found out, it's in the ABC actually, people were wondering why uh, the studios of the ABC in Canberra were numbered one, something or other. Uh, so there was agitation that the amateurs wanted VK1 to uh, make themselves a little different from the the rest of the world, so they got that. <coughs> and of course, uh, some of the early Antarctic work was done under other numbers. And uh, you, you had, uh, of course, Northern Territory for a while were VK5 and uh, uh, the like. Anyway, as I was saying before, we came into a broadcasting that we could actually, the divisions could create a broadcast to inform the country members of the Institute uh, what was happening. Had to be short had to be brief. So in June 1939, we got permission to conduct these broadcasts. However, in September 39, there was another one of these squabbles that came on, so we lost out as usual. The amateur service got their little telegrams telling uh, you were to close down immediately, you were to take all your, uh, box up all your equipment and deliver it to your local post office, who will uh, look after it for the duration of these hostilities. But of course, uh, many amateurs did get, in the various ways, got drafted into the services, either in the uh, uh, fighting side of things, the uh, um, uh, code breaking, all sorts of things. So the amateur service sort of did continue. Now, interestingly, in that time, the WIA, based in Melbourne, apparently, apparently relinquished their hold on it and gave it to New South Wales. So New South Wales, during much of the war, formed the uh, uh, WIA. Anyway, um, you know, the war went on and at the end of the war, again, the authorities were very loath to get back frequencies. It took ages to get things. The first frequencies that came out were 10 metres. That was worldwide in many cases. Um, and... Uh, if you look in old QSTs and similar things, you'll see all these articles on how to work 10 metres, how to start working the surplus equipment that it's about. 
and very gradually we got our way through to get the, the respective bands. And the bands, how did we get them? In the early stages on HF, they said that all amateurs create harmonics. Therefore, give them frequencies that are harmonically related. So apart from the top end of the broadcast band, which is a bit nebulous with uh, what is now 160 metres, we got 80 metres, 40 metres, 20 <coughs> metres, uh, 10 metres, 5 metres, 2.5, and, a half, one and a quarter, and then a bit of a misfit. There was a, a frequency up around 70 centimetres. But anyway, they were the, the things that the, you know, keep these amateurs in their harmonically related uh, bands. And uh, so that was how things went for a while. Uh, those days, of course, you had to do your code. Um, various speeds, some of the speeds went up as high as 14 words per minute to uh, uh, get your uh, licensing. Uh, there were various systems you had at times to uh, do 50 contacts on CW uh, before you could get a, your next stage of life and you had to prove that you were, uh, could be an amateur and uh, the like. So there was a lot of that. But there was the moves, of course, uh, in the 1950s to gain a no-code licence and that's where the limited licence came in in 1954 that uh, these, uh, uh, you know, the same theory same regulations, but no uh, uh, no code, and then and two metres and up, that go, that kept you within Australia. You couldn't go anywhere and annoy anyone because you couldn't read Morse and uh, the likes. Of course, there were those amateurs, these very staunch ones, particularly those that we um, uh, trained during the war to learn Morse, were very uh, devout to their Morse, and these ones that didn't do Morse, these half amateurs. There was a lot of argue about these half amateurs and uh, in uh, uh, the various divisions squabbled over whether they'd be admitted as full members or otherwise in Western Australia. They voted not to accept them. They could only be an associate. So <laughs> the West Australians solved that very easily. They formed the VHF Group Incorporated. And uh, for 50 years that organisation ran in parallel to the division over there. Um, anyway, uh, that is the, the thing, of course, the, uh, as I say, there was the uh, uh, half amateurs. But when the novice came in in the 1970s, oh, there's real problems. Again, these same ones who are, you know, you half amateurs. Well, you know, you've got the same theory as us, but these novices, they don't have the same theory as us. You know, we've got, got to, you know, they're not quite as good as us. Uh, and uh, fortunately... All those old gentlemen just about have uh, gone to their respective directions of, uh, to continue operating. So a lot of that's gone, although there is still uh, some objections towards the foundation people. You do hear at times uh, some objections raised. But anyway, as I said, we had the right to have broadcasts. And the uh, Sunday morning broadcast uh, was uh, um, well and truly underway. And... The 2WI, they started, uh, the ones running that, started wanting a home for 2WI, or VK2WI. But at the same time, there was a group of people who wanted a city building. And uh, uh, the like, that's within the Institute New South Wales structure. Um, in those days, we met at uh, uh, Science House in Gloucester Street on the fourth Friday of the month in their main meeting hall. And I do remember, we've got a few of them here, and plush leather chairs that you could uh, relax in and, uh, you know, it was a very salubrious place to go to. And, uh, um, and uh, anyway, they had their, they had their meetings uh, there. But, as I say, there was a move of people who wanted, and a co-op was formed, to get a city building. Uh, and at the same time, the home for 2WI. Well, eventually the home for 2WI won and uh, so the co-op people put them what money they'd raised into the project. The property at Jewel, which we still have, was uh, bought in uh, 1955. Um, then uh, Burke, VK2EL, was the 
treasurer of the day, he was a bank officer, he beat the vendor down from 350 pounds for the block to 300. So that five acre block that we have up there was uh, 300 pounds in 1955. And uh, anyway, the building got built, the original brick building, half of it. The original plans was to be an H-shaped building and it ended up a T-shaped building. And uh, that was the thing. But there was still interest in getting a headquarters. And in those days, uh, some of the uh, fraternity were able to wangle the right to obtain disposal equipment from the surplus um, store market, the government stores, at the uh, price that universities and other paid for it. But there was a compulsion in having got th that equipment. It could not be resold to our members for less than the remaining uh, lot of that, those lots sold for at auction. So we had to put the prices up apparently. They got a bank balance out of that. And in 1959, they went and bought the um, property in Atchison Street, a small cottage, paid 7,000 pounds for it. And uh, that started to be the, the headquarters. And they still had money. So uh, they then uh, knocked the back of the property down, built the hall that was there, which was a two level. There was a store underneath to mainly continue the disposal side of things that developed into a store proper and a hall up top and became the headquarters. And then when it was all set up and in running mode, it was announced that we'd stop meeting at Science House. Well, those south of the harbour declared that they were not going to cross the bridge for anything. So, uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> so, so they didn't, they they didn't come to uh, the uh, the party. Anyway, we got things underway at uh, Action Street. Just to, um, Jewel was bought a little before my existence. I have been in the organisation since 1958. Um, anyway. Uh, as we say, we've developed, uh, well, we've developed the property at Action Street, a small row of uh, uh, cottages along there, various people. We were number 14. Number 12 was occupied uh, by a chap called Keith, who now has the call sign of ZZO. He had an electronic business there. And at number 10, at one stage, a certain VK2DIK set up one of his first shops and uh, so, uh, uh, but um, we were there till the 80s when the place uh, was starting to be built out, high, little high rise was starting around the, the place. So there was a move at one stage there, there was a club um, down the other side known as the 729 Club and it eventually sort of was heading into receivership or otherwise. So there were some who suggested that perhaps we should uh, acquire that license and uh, uh, establish the place, but uh, the thought in some of the old uh, members of having uh, the place turned into pokey machines or something like that was not on the, uh, their agenda and that it didn't work. And uh, in 1982, they uh, sold the property and uh, bought it at uh, Wigram Street, Parramatta. Not a particularly good building, and we were there, of course, till 2006, which we then uh, had work was coming up to be done. And with the change of the WIA structure, uh, our membership uh, base changed. We lost the bookshop because they wanted it back, even though they gave it to us because they couldn't run it, and a few other things. So uh, Power Matter or Wigman Street became less viable. And in that direction, we thought we'd. Uh, move all activities to Jewel, we'd build a shed. The experts said, oh, you'll get that in a few months' time. Well, it was four years to get that uh, building up at Jewel. There was a little trouble, I think, with the council. It got rejected uh, a couple of times by the uh, planning officer, but the planning officer of the local council surprisingly left rather suddenly. After that, the next uh, operative was very cooperative, so there might have been some uh, difficulty with him. but. As I say, we're in Action Street in the early, uh, well, late 1959. Uh, then we had uh, 
classes conducted there by Seth Bardwell, 2IR. Uh, Seth used to live down here at uh, oh, somewhere around Manly Vale, that sort of that area. Anyway, Seth is also the print principal of uh, Marconi School, so uh, and uh, we ran that correspondence course, plus those classes. Uh, they must have produced hundreds of uh, training books of that era, so a lot of people have been through that uh, course. Um, anyway, back to Action Street. In um, March 1962, it was decided that we'd open the, <coughs> formally open the building, and that was job was given to Wally Hannon, who was then uh, VK2AXH, who was our first secretary, and uh, Wally uh, did the appropriate uh, things of opening the building. He was one of the old school about Morse. He, apparently, in the tape I've heard, uh, he did have some words to say about the half amateurs that uh, weren't really amateurs uh, until they got their code. No. And, uh, oh, it's, you know, it's been... Being such, I had a, a country amateur one time I was president of, uh, in an era at Action Street. Andy sidled up and said, uh, oh, G'day, Timmy. The boys and I have been talking. We don't mind you being president, but it would be much better for the image if you had a full call. And I said, yeah, well, how much are they costing this week? Well, he stormed out and never spoke to me for the next five years. <laughs> but uh, there was, you know, there was the rumours about of, uh, just in that you know, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, licenses did get obtained around the country. Early days of novice, I think it was $250 in Victoria you could get uh, get your license sat for you. And uh, in those days, the uh, department, of course, conducted the exams. The exams were every three months. And the very early ones, of course, were the written ones. Uh, five questions out of seven in the theory. And uh, uh, was it? Four or so out of uh, five or so in the regulations, and it's you know two and a half hours written theory paper. None of this multiple ticking. You know you had to write the uh, the thing, and uh, uh, as I say, the department did quite a uh, used to conduct them. They had quite a big intake one time at Macquarie University. They used a lecture room over there, and there was literally hundreds of people sitting for the exam. And they took a lot of promotional photographs. In fact, they photographed everyone. But uh, I think they did round up a few that uh, didn't get the license they were intending. Uh, but anyway, you know, we know it these days, of course, have swung it over to uh, the operation through the uh, WIA structure. And of course, uh, you keep noticing that ACMA keeps redevolving itself into various things. I saw a license today that uh, um, had been renewed, but it, it came out as the receipt saying, you know, here's your li license. Now, if you want the actual license, you've got to print it out yourself. Go on the net and go looking for it. And, of course, those who might have a license coming up fairly soon, you might have heard, of course, the, the renewal was $51. Sorry, that was before this month. It's $52 now. So uh, they, they keep needing things. Anyway, as I say, we uh, moved out of Action Street uh, at that era. But uh, 2WI had been developed fairly well as the broadcast facility. Uh, that was the morning broadcast conducted out of there in those days at 11am in the morning. And uh, there was an evening broadcast conducted by the VHF group. Uh, that came about... By, by the fact that they couldn't get their news into the main broadcast because, after all, if it wasn't something on 80 metres, the uh, compilers weren't interested. So it was very much an HF broadcast in the morning by comparison. And there was the... Uh, so they conducted a, an evening news session. But in those days, you could not transmit uh, without establishing a contact. So you couldn't come up to give a news bulletin to nobody. So what had happened... At an appropriate time, at about uh, uh, 7.30 on a Sunday evening, one station would come up and he'd call another one and ask him, what's been happening in the last uh, week? And then the other station would come on and say, well, I've got a bit of information, and they'd rattle off a broadcast in this <laughs> net. You know, he, was a, he had established the contact. He, 
he was doing it in the, the legal uh, fashion. And uh, so, and that used to be done from wherever you could, uh, if you had a good station you did it. Sydney of course much more. Um, but gradually it started to drift up to Jewel which had a better coverage and as Sydney expanded and so uh, the VHF group became the evening broadcast. The VHF group and later the TV and TV group was the uh, uh, more the technical side of things. There was the monthly meetings, monthly general meetings. There was a VHF group meeting, and they were, as a body, were fairly active. They had a day event, one Sunday per month, a night event, a fox hunt, on a Wednesday night. Uh, and those days, you didn't have highway patrol sitting around the corner. You could race wherever you like. I remember having a being the fox on one occasion up here at Ingleside, the start was a top ride. The airline distance, we could not exceed an airline distance of 15 miles, so that was 14 point something airline to there, but much further to get into the back of Ingleside and up. The uh, first car in got there in 28 minutes. So, uh, hearing down your Monovale Road here, at a, but in the 60s, who was going to worry them? Um, Okay, um, also at Jewel in the early days we had field days, um, mainly fox hunting and things like that, a bit of a uh, little bit of trade uh, type operations and uh, the likes. But in the late 60s, 90, August 1969, somebody broke into the place, mainly to be a, a menace, stripped everything off, uh, took all the connectors off, boards, all sorts of things. And they came up on the Sunday morning to do the broadcast, discovered this, raced down to Action Street, which had a station in those days, conducted it from there. He came down and paid that visit the following week. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, he, uh, the building next door to us was being uh, constructed at the time, so he was able to climb up, get on the roof, uh, cut a coax. The roof had uh, Perspex um, fiberglass sheets. So, as lighting, so he undid one of those, cut the coax, slid down on the coax and uh, wrecked the place in there. So we assumed he was a little lightweight bloke. Ultimately, he got caught. Uh, he was dobbed in by some disgruntled female over uh, some fraud that he was up to, apparently. And uh, the law discovered he had this garage full of stuff. Ours was very easy to identify. It had two WI stencils all over it. Um, and uh, but he went round in those days. There was the Walsons, National Radio Supply, places like that. He'd raided all of them, and he had this garage full of stuff. And I had to identify our stuff at, over at Balmain. And I'm scratching through things, and I picked up an ice cream tin in those days, metal. And there's a constable observing things just to make sure that it's all above board or something. And I picked up this tin, and it was heavy took the lid off and I just said to him, I think you might want to see this. When they finished counting, there was 500 Morris, Minor and similar Leyland vehicle keys in there. In those days, the uh, key number was stamped on your lock, on your uh, ignition switch. So all he had to do was go and read the number off a car, um, go and get himself a key that suited, tie a label on to say which car it was, so he's probably, uh, I'm never sure what happened to him in the long run, but anyway, that put him out of business. Um, okay, well, Action Street was just about run out, it was getting pretty congested. And if you've, anyone's been down that way lately, as I drove down the street and, and looked in wonderment, the properties between uh, number 18 and 4, I think it is, totally raised. There's now a 30 odd story building going up in its uh, place. So uh, that's the end of that side of things. And the Wigram Street place, which we were there till 2006, had a few strange operations after we left, but uh, uh, nothing much happened. The latest report I've got is that it actually seems to have been converted into three flats. Uh, but that part of town is not particularly good unless you happen to be. Uh, Indian and some other nationalities they fight out pretty well in Wigram Street. So it's not, it, it got to the point that parking was bad 
we're having vehicles broken into under the building even there, so it is, uh, we got out of the place. So, um, as I say, we then headed to uh, um, the dual system. And, uh, um, yep, as I say, we sold, sold that off uh, in uh, 2006. And so we've settled in fairly well to uh, dual now. And uh, which is where we're going to be. About 20 odd years ago, we had some of our bean counter good quality amateurs tell us that the uh, dual property wasn't making it, wasn't paying its way, had to be sold. So others took it in their own hands and chased around and got a tenant, which is what the big tower is at dual, and uh, so we get an income. And uh, um, that, that stayed them off from uh, things. Uh, also, getting back to the Action Street days, we had paid secretaries there and at Wigwam Street. Nowadays, we run on purely on voluntary uh, side of things. Uh, as I said earlier in the thing, um, do, so that there would not be confusion, the former companies, which are only two in Australia, uh, Amateur Radio Victoria and Amateur Radio New South Wales both protected themselves by uh, heading off uh, with the uh, trading trading names and still retain the uh, rest of the uh, operations as such. All the other states who are only in corporations or otherwise literally got uh, absorbed back into, well, their assets were absorbed by the WA structure and they disappeared out to be radio clubs or otherwise. So. Uh, that was the uh, side of things. As I say, we, we, we try very hard to keep identifying ourselves as Amateur Radio New South Wales because there are still people who get us confused between them. We get people who think that paying membership to us gives them the uh, WIA and the other thing. And of course, the name WIA comes up when the uh, annual accounts come out because they, that's what it has to be uh, branded at. Um, and uh, Jewel, of course, uh, we've developed into uh, the repeaters on that site. Uh, they went in in 1970, the first one. took us two years to get it licensed. And, of course, the department couldn't understand these funny offsets and everything that the amateurs wanted to use. And we've got the net network of beacons. Uh, and these days we've got the uh, slow morse, uh, well, not so much slow morse, the actual service slow morse has been uh, terminated last year. That was done by uh, Ross Turiar at Orange. But uh, uh, we've got the other one running on uh, 80 metres 3699 as a top end uh, uh, band marker. The department was difficult. The, first, the, license, the request for the licence went in and there was a decimal point slip and it came up as 3699 decimal 9. The department said you can't maintain that level of accuracy, so uh, it sits on three six nine nine. So it's a top end uh, uh, indicator, <coughs> and uh, of course, just getting back into the other side of amateur radio. Generally, of course, we acquired more frequencies over the years. We uh, know that uh, apart from re uh, things altering on the uh, VHF bands, the uh, original. Uh, uh, well 144 remained, 288 uh, went out of existence, 576 hung round for a while, that was literally channel 35 on television and it got absorbed into that. And they were again harmonically related and then of course we've got the other relationship uh, in the worldwide side of things is 2 metres, 70 centimetres and uh, 23 centimetres and our third harmonic uh, related thing. But uh, we gained the new bands, as they, uh, AWL DX News keeps calling them at times, uh, of uh, the uh, what, was it 17 metres, 12 metres, and 10 metres, uh, 30 metres rather. So we gained that after the uh, 1979 ITU or what? Yes, but as I say, the uh, the uh, 
the AWLD ex keeps referring to them as the new band. Um, and of course, we've got the other little one, a jewel. We had a, a problem in coverage of broadcast-wise in some of these areas of the sunspot. You get a point where 80 metres uh, go so far and absorbed out. 40 metres is on long skip. So there's a zone like the, like the donut, 80 metres at the centre of the donut and 40 metres on the outside. So we opted to uh, gain the frequency of 5 megs. The national body didn't think we were the right thing to do, but stuffed them, we were doing it. So we obtained uh, the uh, commercial frequency of uh, 5425, goes under the call sign of VKE 580. It's uh, only permitted to be a one-way service. We can only transmit out. We can't respond on it. Hopefully one day we'll get it... Uh, we'll be able to talk up there. There is two other frequencies in 5 megs that the WIA has, which are Weissman frequencies. They're about 5.1 and 5.3, somewhere in that vicinity. But I don't know whether they've ever been effectively used. Um, We transmit on 5425. Yeah, every Sunday morning. Uh, we don't do callbacks on there. Not on that frequency. But we do. 5425, upper side band. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Well, it depends whether you listen to the uh, broadcast because it, the frequencies are quoted in the yeah, ident period. Hmm? Yeah. 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 No, it's a, um, and it g goes well. I mean, we've been running it now for what is it, 10 years or so. Um, and it's happily going. As I say, one day we might be able to have two-way contacts on it. And on the moment it does, It'll be so congested we wouldn't, won't get a word in each way. Um, but, you know, that's hopefully, because the world is working, both the WIA and the rest of the world is working on trying to get the segments there. So the big hassle in Australia, because they'll put the act on, is getting clear channels. There's very much commercial allocation throughout that. Um, it's like when we gained... Uh, uh, the 10 megs, the 30 metre band. We had to avoid a frequency for quite some time till that service eventually closed down. Unless we were prepared to pay 50,000 for them to recrystal their operations elsewhere. So we just avoided, uh, what was it, uh, 10141 for a few years. Um, okay, that's, as I say, some of the. Uh, some of the uh, the background that we we as the WIA um, and of course they they take the credit for being the oldest uh, national society in the world. We were 1910. The Brits were 1912, 1913. The AWL 1914. So uh, we were uh, the longest serving ones in that uh, uh, direction. And as I say, we're fairly continuous. Um, so uh, the dual property, we had the upgrade recently. They uh, revamped a uh, roof, made a fireproof roof, uh, bricked up the end wall, which was once to be the extension. We decided, having the other building on site, we were never going to expand to the original design of the H system. There'd have been no way of um, uh, utilising the extra property that was formed out of it, so uh, they bricked the end wall up. Um, we've uh, just been through a, an exercise with the uh, um, library. The library was never to be the library, it was a storage area, but uh, got into the library. It wasn't fully lined, so it's been lined. There is a team that comes in on Monday nights to... Uh, uh, they're supposed to be librarians playing with uh, books, but they spent a lot of time on uh, computers for some reason. And, uh, but occasionally they box up a few books, log a few things in. So eventually we'll... And the library is fairly extensive. We've got books that go back 
In fact, I was looking at one earlier today that uh, got unearthed out of a pile somewhere. It's a tiny little book, and it's written by somebody for tram drivers in 1903, I think it was, telling you how to drive trams. So uh, there's all sorts of funnies that we get there. Um, so that generally is the background to New South Wales. It's uh, in a very bridged form. There's a bit of paper. There's a few more here than for the paper, so you can fight over it or get some more at some stage. Um, on some occasion, I might talk on a couple of other subjects, which is Wally Hannon, which I did a lot of research on to find out what he did in the, the system, and the development of repeaters, which came into existence in, uh, for us, legally, uh, about June, July 1968, and uh, the background on how the band plans developed, why they developed, and all that went with it, but that's perhaps for another occasion. With that, thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. Can I, can I yeah well, a little bit parched after that. Uh, a soft drink, thanks. Can we ask a question? Hmm? Can we ask a question? Yes, yes. The numbers, there's a, what are 15,000 or so in Australia. They have, at one stage, we're about one in a thousand in the population. It has declined, I think. It's now it's one, one and a bit more than uh, uh, 1,000, 1,500, something like that. We don't gain as much. There are certainly amateurs coming in. I mean, I'll have that one, thanks. Um, look at the... Uh, Largely the growth of uh, foundation. The foundations, of course, uh, many of those are doing upgrades pretty well. They go right through. We had uh, um, <coughs> we had a course on last uh, last weekend, and one of those who's got his foundation out of that immediately uh, joined the upgrade class to uh, continue. Um, but what's it doing? It's remarkably quiet at times by comparison. It, Going back to the early days of repeaters, you could not get a word in on a repeater. Um, but you take the uh, dual one, um, and of course in the early days there was Heathcote for St George and dual for us, and they never shut up. Heathcote of course has a disadvantage these days that it got thrown off the site it was on, or by the fact that uh, Optus took over and made it very difficult to uh, gain access to the site. Um, and it's down at Engadine and not well elevated. <coughs> but uh, dual can go for hours without much uh, noise. It does have an intermod, as you're probably aware. Uh, so does the tenant. They've got an equal intermod from uh, the structure. They have on site a uh, trunking network of, I think it's 18 channels. <coughs> and that combination about, if three channels come up, including the control tone channel, which is what the buzz noise is that you hear. Uh, it knocks the uh, it, it locks up. If our repeater gets key, it locks up until such time as one of theirs goes off and it unlocks itself. Um, but I, I think there is acti certainly there's activity, but it's so diverse now. What used to be literally on a couple of repeaters or uh, HF. Uh, sideband mode for example uh, nowadays there's so many of these other modes that come in that there's a lot of you know a lot of people playing uh, whisper and uh, similar sorts of things and a lot of these other various other modes all up there's probably the degree of activity you've only got to listen at times to the contest and the like see what happens next weekend with the John Moyle there'll be people going out um, but there's a mixture of things. I think there's less mobile activity. I don't very rarely come up mobile because uh, um, having some new constable you know, pull up and you've got a telephone there, driver, try and explain to them it's not a telephone, it's not worth the, the hassle of... Because if you say 
word sideways to you and you've insulted them or attacked them or something. Um, but, you know, it's, it's healthy to see the, the way the foundation has taken on. But there again, these people come on and I was only reading through the core book last couple of days just looking through the thing. There are names that I've never heard, calls I've never heard active. So a lot of people do get a call and hang on to it and either don't have the gear or the, the mere fact that you can't have the gear. You know, you live in uh, uh, systems that, you know, you can't throw the dipole out because the body corporate won't let you or similar. There's those that do, by devious means, get, get around the uh, thing. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I know oh, Barry AAB over it, who uh, was at Normanhurst for 40 odd years, did have a minor run in with the local uh, council ranger who came and told him that the uh, uh, beam that he had there had no approval. He said, well, it's only been there 40 years. But it turned out that the uh, house next door with the new snobs that had acquired <coughs> that um, had decided that. Uh, you know, this thing has to go, so you, you just complain to the council. And the council, uh, I heard on another occasion in the Hornsby area, <coughs> somebody was tagging along with a house inspection crew, and he's standing there looking at a nice antenna next door. And the real estate bloke sidled up to him and said, oh, that's no problem. What you do is, when, you, when you've got the place there, you complain to the council, they'll get it removed for you. So he took no real note, but trotted off to the uh, real estate, got hold of the principal of the real estate and uh, gave him a slight lecture on the ethics of his uh, um, salesman. Uh, so there is that sort of... And you, you, you see the reports uh, around, you hear them on the, the news bulletin, our news bulletin, you see them in Radcom and places like that. Every so often there's these fights develop, you know, Madam doesn't like this thing, or it's... Uh, giving you a headache, or any, any excuse to... It's like the era that we've been through, with, you know, they're not doing it nowadays with, fu with mobile phones, but there's a tower going to be built. Oh, it's going to irradiate the kids in the kindergarten next door, all these sorts of things. And it's only in the eye of the beholder. They've got they, either that or they get on Dr Google and get the false information. <coughs> but you... I've been to a few odd meetings and thrown questions in, uh, about these winges in the same direction, you know. Do you notice over our way, I'm not sure whether they're doing it over this way, I think they might, of using power pylons as uh, um, cell phone supports. And, uh, you know, they get on there. Th these people can't see that. They're, it's not there. But if you wanted to put up a single monopole stick uh, around the corner, oh, do you know, or it's all around the horizon, it's affecting my view or some other... Uh, win. Do you use a phone? Oh yes. Yeah. Well, how do you think it works? Yeah. Uh, but they they don't comprehend that, or it, it's going to irradiate. Uh, yeah. It, uh, you, not, I've said, you know, uh, you know, uh, oh, it's dangerous. To, you know, that tower's dangerous. And I said, do you use a phone? Oh yes. Where do you hold it? Yeah. Uh, do you, you know, when it's cold, do you have a radiator on? Yeah. Is it on the other side of the room and? Uh, yeah. What happens if you put it up against your face? Oh, don't be stupid. Well, that's what you're doing with a phone. Get your facts right before you start. You to get told that I'm ignorant or something like that, and away they go. Um, yes, hopefully it is. Yes. I have no idea. <laughs> Yes. I, I got... Uh, <laughs> 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 it was funny that. I, I, I appeared in the, uh, the institute structure. I, I, I built a one-valve receiver and I happened to hear this strange broadcast thing on a Sunday morning. So we're about to move to Mossman then from Chatswood. So I had enough idea of what was going on. I wrote to this organisation and asked what operation on VHF would be like for Mossman. So I got invited to, you know, here's a membership form, join up, and I wandered along, and about the second meeting I got roped into being uh, 
on the SWL group and became secretary of said, said same group. Uh, WIAL 2052, I think I might have been. But uh, we gained a few in those days. There's a lot of SWL. I think the last number I saw was up around about 250. So we did gain a lot of associates. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh yes. I'll admit that I did I did I fixed one, one neighbour once in that direction who complained that there, there was uh, interference. I do know that it, the, the uh, ribbon running up to the side of my house did have an effect on them. But unfortunately I left a time clock running and I wasn't home. In fact I was known to be in Newcastle and I got told next day, Oh you you you're interfering again. I said, Oh it couldn't have been me. I was and you, oh, that's right, you were away. No, it must be something else. Yeah. So uh, that quietened that one down. Um, anyone else like to go? Uh, okay. Um, you were asking about in the, the area of frequencies, a few here on the frequencies that run out of Jewel, which includes our um, 5425 and... Uh, that's largely the notes I read from that, uh, um, the history of uh, New South Wales. Right. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.